I love the story of, and I've heard it told a bunch of different ways. I don't know if it's a true story or if it's a folk tale. But either way, I love the story of there's a psychologist who decides she's going to do some research. So she goes into a kindergarten classroom, and she asks all the kids, she says, boys and girls, it's so great to be here. Who loves art? And all the hands go up. And then she says, boys and girls, that's wonderful you all love art. Who here is an artist? And every single hand in the kindergarten shoots up. Then she walks down the hall, and she goes to a third grade classroom, and she says, boys and girls, uh, who loves art? And again, many hands go up, a few less this time. And she says, boys and girls, who here is an artist? Half of the hands now go up. Then she goes down the street to the middle school, goes into a seventh grade classroom. This time she doesn't say boys and girls, of course. She says uh, young people. And she says, young people, who here loves art? A few hands go up. Who here is an artist? Not a single hand in the seventh grade classroom goes up. Then she goes down the street one more time and goes to the high school and sees a bunch of seniors in high school getting ready to go off to college. And she says, uh, young men and women, who here loves art? And a few hands go up. And who here is an artist? And the few kids who have identified now as being artistic, those hands go up. Now, the reason I bring this up is because we can do this not with art and being an artist, but we can do this with various things. I want you to, real quick, I'm going to ask you this question. So, I want you to write down the first five adjectives you think of to describe yourself. Take out your phone and take out a notepad. I'm going to do it with you to give you enough time. Or write it on your piece of paper, or just do it in your head. I want you to take a moment to write down five describing words that you use to describe yourself. I'm going to do it real quick. So I'm going to do this. There's one. There's two. Okay. Three, I got to think. Yeah, I'll do this one. Okay. Do this with me. Four. Okay. And five. Now, I go fast, so I'm going to give an extra pause. Hopefully, we have a couple describing words. It's okay if you don't have five. Three is good. Who here has the word leader written on your list? Did anyone write down the word leader? I see one hand. So this is interesting. Leader is one of these words that maybe we don't have baggage with the word art or artist. Two hands. Thank you. Thank you. Um, sometimes with the word leader, we have a lot of baggage with this word, kind of like middle schoolers with the word artist. Because we have a lot of reasons why we say, I'm not a leader. I'm going to convince you today, biblically, in a moment, that if you can answer yes to two questions, and we'll get to those in a second, I'm going to say that you are a leader, but let's talk about the reasons why we say we're not leaders. Let's go through them. Maybe I say I'm too introverted. Maybe I say I'm too extroverted, right? Maybe I'm too all over the place to be a leader. Maybe I say, hey, you know what? Um, that's someone else's role. I'm, as a Christian, just here to support and to serve. Does anyone feel that way? Or maybe you say, you know, I don't have the right training to be a leader. Does anyone ever wonder that? Okay, or maybe you say, you know, I kind of blew my shot at that, and God's just using me in a different way. Maybe you feel that way. There's a many, many different reasons why we can say we are not a leader, why we can be like in that middle school classroom with that teacher in that folk story, as those kids asked, hey, are you an artist? And None of the hands go up. In kindergarten, they did, but in seventh grade, they don't. We can do the same thing with this question of leader, but I want to ask you two questions. First question, am I a Jesus follower? Now, you don't have to put your hands up, but think in your head. If you follow Jesus, the Bible says, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, and has all sorts of different things that say that if you're a Jesus follower, you have an identity, a mission, and a method so that sounds like leadership. So if you answer yes to that, I want us to think. And then question number two is, am I part of the church? Not this church, the church. The church is the called out people of God. God says, on this rock, I'm going to build my church, my ecclesia, my called out people that even the gates of hell don't stand against. So if you answer yes to number one and yes to number two, I have good news for you or maybe bad news. You are a leader according to the Bible. The Bible says, go therefore and make disciples. That means not be passive and kind of wait, but go. 
And the Bible also says you're the light of the world as the church, a city on a hill. That's leadership. That's a responsibility. That's wonderful, but maybe as we're following the complexity of life, we're saying, you know, I'm not a leader. That's, that has nothing to do with me. David, it's fine for you as a, as a pastor to say you're a leader. Sure, you're talking to a whole bunch of people and you're interpreting some things from Scripture. That's leadership. But me, I'm not a leader. Again, I'm too introverted. I'm too extroverted. I'm too all over the place. I blew it. You know, I've messed up so much. God's not going to use me as a leader. I'm just here to be quiet and kind. Well, maybe in your quietness and kindness, there's a leadership, and we'll talk about that. But the reality is, is that if we answer yes to these two questions, we get to look at this theological foundation, that a leader falls under two things. A leader is a shepherd and a servant. Now, I'm going to first use ancient world to explain these, and I want to use a modern illustration. A shepherd is someone who is with sheep and leads the sheep. Now, sometimes you can, in your marriage, in your family, in your workplace, feel like you are the sheep or you are the cats. Anyone ever feel like they're herding cats at work? <laughs> Anyone ever feel like you are a cat being herded at work? Now, here's our theological foundation of this. A shepherd is not someone who is mean to the sheep, but who loves and serves the sheep. We'll get into the service, but and loves and protects and guides and leads the sheep. Now, you'll see that in this text, you're going to look at with leadership, Moses leads everybody, and God's put Moses in a position to lead everybody. Moses has to pick other leaders. And if you notice, not all leaders have the same responsibility, and that's okay. Some of the leaders are over a thousand people, some over less. There are leaders like Moses over everybody, and there's leaders over 10 people, and they're equally important to God. So when I'm saying you're a leader, if you answer both my questions, I'm not saying you now have to, maybe you do, but probably not. I'm not saying you got to quit everything and say, that's it, I'm going to go start a church tomorrow, and I'm going to just lead this movement of God, and it's going to be unbelievable starting tomorrow, and I have to just totally let go of everything else. Now, maybe, but probably not. Probably there's a different way God's going to use you as a leader starting right now, and it applies, because the reality is that sometimes we feel stuck in places. Sometimes we look and say, hey, you know, I feel just kind of like I'm teetering. I, I, I don't know. The world's so polarized. Life is so polarized, and my life is much more polarized than I want. I get, I get sucked into these, these fights on Facebook and these arguments in my workplace and these disagreements at the dinner table, and it just gets overwhelming for me. Christian biblical leadership, servant, shepherd, really helps us. It's like an umbrella. Who here owns an umbrella? Okay, good. This is, a, I thought so. The problem is, any shepherds here? See, I didn't think we'd have a lot of shepherds. Uh, the reverend is being theologically correct in raising his hand for shepherd. Actually, you're all shepherds, and we'll talk about that. But truthfully, none of us are occupational shepherds. So let's talk about the umbrella. When it's drizzly... And I say, you know what? I'm going to go ahead and open my umbrella. That is kind of like being a shepherd. Because what I do is I open my umbrella, and I now signal to everybody else, hey, it's okay to open your umbrella too. That's all leadership is. It doesn't necessarily mean I need to tell everyone what to do. Sometimes it's simply living by example, right? We have that phrase, leading by example. Open up my umbrella. But the biblical model of leadership includes something else, too. It's not just, here's me with my umbrella, and ha, 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 you forgot yours. It's, oh, you forgot yours? I care about you. Come under my umbrella. Or even there's times where I share my umbrella with you and I get a little wet. That is biblical leadership. It's this marriage. Because, look, Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays his life down for the sheep. So when we understand leadership... Biblical leadership, and remember, you passed, if you pass my two questions of am I a Jesus follower, yes, am I part of the church, not just this church, the church, yes, then we get an opportunity to see how being more of a biblical leader, a shepherd and a servant, can really help us in our lives, can really help us not simply start a church, which is wonderful. I, I love church planners. I love this church. It's great that we're here. 
But if we simply say the words of the Bible help in a church con context, the problem is we're missing so much of the truth of Scripture, that Scripture is the ultimate authority for us, and it applies to everything. I'm trying to potty train my daughter right now. I won't go into any depth, any details. Pray for me. Pray for my wife too, right? <laughs> Scripture is the ultimate authority, right? Patience, shepherding, servant, it all applies in every single area of our lives. Now, I want to talk a little bit about our text. You're used to having a problem at this point that we like to address. We'll do that in a minute. I want to talk about this guy, Moses. Here's a pretty picture of him. Look at that. You were maybe expecting a picture of Charlton Heston some of you don't know who Charlton Heston is, and that's really sad. <laughs> but I figure we all can identify with stained glass. Now, we're going to talk about Exodus, because you can say, David, uh, you know, last week, because we're going through the Bible this year, last week we dealt with Joseph, and this is confusing. Why are we in Exodus chapter 18? What happened? Well, thank you so much for asking. Let's talk about it. So, Exodus chapter 1, you have a group of people that are in captivity, what God used for good in, in Genesis 50 certainly saved the people from famine, but the reality is, is a ways into it, a number of years into it, Pharaoh decides, he looks, Pharaoh is the king of Egypt, he looks and he sees that those Israelites are starting to be a little bit, a bit of a problem. And they're starting to really multiply and really be fruitful, and they're following all God's commandments. And ooh, that's... So, Pharaoh decides to crack down on them and say, you know what, you're no longer just living here, you're now going to be slaves. And it's awful. And Israel still does really well, and they really are multiplying, and, and more and more is happening. And finally, we get to this point where this little baby is born, Moses, and you've got the little basket. Remember, the little, the little baby goes in the basket, floats down the river. Pharaoh's daughter gets Moses, eventually raises him. He becomes a man. And he's ready to lead the people out, right? Nope, he decides to murder someone. So if you ever say, hey, uh, you know, the problem with me of looking at people in Scripture is they're just so perfect and I'm not. I don't know, Moses is an actual murderer. So, like, there's that. So, not endorsing it, I'm just saying he's not perfect. So he murders someone, and does he face accountability for his crime? He does not. He runs into the wilderness away from the, he becomes a fugitive, right? He runs away from the federal marshals and Pharaoh and everything, and he's gone. He takes off for like 40 years. And the generation kind of dies out, and now he's out there, and he has this opportunity to speak to a bush, a burning bush. It's actually God speaking through the bush. We have this rise of Moses, and he realizes that even though he's got all his fear and imperfections and all these things, he can lead for God. Now, he, he gives a hundred reasons why he can't. He says things like, oh, you don't understand, God. I'm not the right person. You need to send someone else. And so God says, sure, I'll send Aaron too, but you're still going, Moses. Come on, get, let's, let's go. So now he goes, and we have this confrontation with Pharaoh. Plagues, right? So we have all these plagues. We have frogs, we have locusts, etc. You can look at it. This happens in Exodus 5 through 11. Now, You'll notice that each time Moses gives really sound advice, he gives facts and logic to Pharaoh about why Pharaoh should let the people go. Does Pharaoh let them go? He does not. More plagues. And then the people of Egypt start to like respect God and they're like, wow, why Pharaoh are you messing with these Israelites? Because like their God is real and there's these plagues um, and they start to look up to Moses and does Pharaoh let the people go? He does not. It happens many, many times. Okay, finally... Pharaoh decides to let the people go. They leave Egypt. But Pharaoh changes his mind, and he sends an army out. And the people are crossing the Red Sea. The people, the Israelite people are saved. But Pharaoh's armies and chariots are all thrown into the sea. And so then, in chapter 15, we get this wonderful song of deliverance. And we have our first steps in the wilderness. Now, is life perfect in the wilderness? It's not. It's very confusing and very odd. But there is this wonderful story in Exodus 17 that happens right before here, and we want to put this in our brains because everything we talk about with Exodus 18, we need to remember this in 17. A group of people that if you listen to the Through the Bible, I mispronounce the name of the tribe, and so I'm not going to do it. It's the Amma something, okay? That tribe of people, one of the, I've been told one of the fun parts of the Through the Bible is that I mispronounce all the names and I do my best, so we just do our best with Scripture. Okay, so 
we have this tribe that attacks the Israelites, and they have to fight them. And so Moses, with his two buddies, goes on the mountain, and any time Moses has the staff up in the air, he's doing well. But try doing this for a second. Everybody do this with me. Hold your staff up. There we go. Okay. Who thinks they can hold that for the whole sermon? You probably could. Who thinks you could hold that all day? Probably not. Now add a really heavy ancient world staff. You can put your arms down. So Moses... Every time he puts his arms down, the Israelites start losing, so immediately he sees he can't do everything on his strength. Remember that. Can Moses do everything on his strength? He cannot. I'm going to ask you one more time. Can Moses do everything by himself as the big shot, being the ultimate judge? He is the great I am. Does that work? So he finds that out, right? And so he's got this two, these two buddies who actually hold his arms up for him as he literally just wants to take a nap. They win, and now Jethro comes in. Now we have Moses' father-in-law. He's one of the strangest and most wonderful characters in Scripture. He's, he's just this wonderful sage, this mentor, this Gandalf, this Obi-Wan Kenobi. When we think of the hero's journey, won't go into the weeds, this is kind of the mentor figure for Moses' hero's journey. He's going to have this whole thing that's going to happen in the wilderness with these people, and they're going to make bad choices, and he's going to be so frustrated. But this mentor is going to come and give him some really, really wise advice. And that's where we are today. We're going to look at that because you're going to see that there is a model that Jethro is going to give us that is so much better than what Moses is trying to do. Moses, even though in the previous chapter, every time his buddies helped him hold the staff up and worked together, things went well. And every time he tried to do it himself, it went poorly, he's going to once again try to do everything by his big self, as my three-year-old says. Dad, I'm going to do this by my big self. So I'm serious. And he tries to do it all by his big self. And Jethro, this wonderful wise man, is going to come in and say, Moses, what are you really accomplishing here? This is not good. This is not helpful. It's like middle school. Who remembers being a middle schooler? Okay, I always love going back to middle school because in our worst moments, we do that middle school mentality. Can we agree? So in my weakest moments in middle school, I came to a new town and I decided that I was brilliant and I could take on the entire project myself. Anybody have this issue? Where you say, hey, uh, you know, teacher, you're giving groups to everyone else. I'm smarter than... I was the kid who said this to my teacher. My teacher must have hated me, but... Um, I said to the teacher, you know, I actually am smarter than everyone else, so I don't need a group. You, I, I've said this to my teacher. She's a wonderful saint, a wonderful saint, um, sixth grade. So I said to her, I don't need a group, just give me by myself. And she's like, okay, fine. Do you think that worked? Nope, it didn't work. And about a week later, she said, David, I've now given you a group, and they're going to help you catch up, Okay. So that's kind of what we're going to see here, is that Moses is going to learn he can't do it by himself, because we have a problem in our lives. It's easy to grind. Grinding can sound like a really good thing. Who here says, hey, I'm a really hard worker? I'm not shaming you. I try to see it. I'm a hard worker. So if you say you're a hard worker, wonderful. The problem is that sometimes we have a gospel of hard work, which is a false gospel. If I just say, hey, I'm saved by my hard work, that's I won't go into the weeds. It's called works righteousness. That's not a thing that we do. So the reality is, is I know that salvation comes from grace alone, and I know in my life I need Jesus, okay? So here's the thing. It's easy to grind, fully embrace busy. Hey, I'm maxed out, and I feel great about it. You don't have to put your hand up, but can anyone identify with this? Hey, I've maxed out that, that schedule, and you know, I just feel so good about all this busy. I'm this and this and this, and yes, I'm stretched thin, but I feel so good about how much I'm doing. The problem is we drive. Imagine you're in a little bus. You're driving not off a cliff necessarily, but towards something called burnout. Now, here's the thing. Last year, the big buzzword in Google searches and in research and scholarship and in leadership was this word called anxiety. The word this year is burnout. This is the word that people are dealing with. Now, when we think of burnout... The problem with driving to burnout is that the road to burnout is often paved with good intentions, right? You're used to another phrase. You're used to another phrase. I'm repurposing that because there's a psychologist, and his name was Herden, Herbert Freudenberger, and in the 70s, he really identified this idea of burnout syndrome. And here's what he said that burnout syndrome really is, and let's see if we can identify. 
a state of perpetual exhaustion from your job, and then you start your second job at home. The World Health Organization says that burnout isn't actually a health condition or a medical condition as much as an occupational condition. You're going to see that, like Moses, we can find ourselves driving towards burnout. We, we grind, we say, I, I'm busy and that's okay, and we head in that direction towards burnout, and the Jethro in our life needs to come out and say, hey, what are you trying to accomplish here? What you're doing is not good. This is going to wear you out. It's going to wear the people out. What? No. So here's our big idea. And this is something, I don't always have us say these together, but I'm going to read this once, and then I want us to read it together. Here's our big idea today. Instead of fully grinding, embracing busy, and driving towards burnout, I am a leader. Remember, if you answered yes to one and yes to two, I am a leader who builds a team and shares the load. Let's read it in three, two, one. I am a leader who builds a team and shares the load. This is what Jethro is going to show us, and let's get started right here. Jethro starts. So we're going to look at a couple verses in this text, Exodus 18, really quickly and really clearly. He says something really helpful. Here's what we can know. I'm a leader, so I can embrace what I do well. Because it's easy to start from a place of negativity, right? If you're saying, hey, I'm driving towards burnout, that just means I'm the worst and nothing I'm doing is right and it's so awful and David, you're right, I just need to stop everything. Well, not necessarily. There's probably things that each of us are doing well. Let's look at what Jethro says. In verse 19 of Exodus 18, listen to me and let me give you a word of advice and may God be with you. You should continue to be the people's representative before God, bringing them their disputes to Him. Teach them God's decrees and give them His instructions. Show them how to conduct their lives. Notice that Jethro is not saying, Moses, full stop, this is a mess, completely stop. He says what? He says, continue to be. The issue is not necessarily Moses as a person, it's his unsustainable pace. If you're finding yourself driving towards burnout and you're not embracing this biblical leadership idea in your life, in your marriage, in your parenting, in your greater family, in your workplace, we can say, hey, it's not that everything is the issue. Maybe the pace is the issue. Maybe, maybe I can look at some things and change some things up a little bit. Because the reality is, is that if we look at Moses' load, it's unsustainable, but his role isn't. He's got some good skills that are worth building on. And so Jethro says, teach, give, show. Those are Moses' strengths. Now, your, your strengths may not be teach, give, and show. They may not be. They may. There are strengths that each of us have, and we can build on those. It makes me think of a time when I was doing my student teaching, and I had been teaching for a number of years. I, I'm also a, a teacher. I'm a special ed teacher. And I was teaching for a number of years, and I thought it was great. And then I had a student teacher evaluator come into my room, and she annihilated me. Has anyone ever been annihilated in a review or something at work? Mine was worse, I promise you. How bad was it? Ask my family afterwards. I, was, I say that I'm untouchable and that things don't bother me. This bothered me, and I was not untouchable. So here's what she said to me. She said, David, what you're doing is not good. I'm going to steal Jethro's line. She didn't exactly say that, but here's what she said. You're not a teacher. What you're doing is not teaching. This is not, te I don't know what this is. This is not teaching. You're like a leader and a mentor, but you're not teaching. We got to get you back to the basics because this is not teaching. Now, at first, what did I hear? I heard, you are not a teacher. This is not teaching. But she said something else. And it took me a little while. It actually took my wife to point this out. You're a leader and a mentor for your classroom, and those are unique skills. Those are what you do well. You just got to work on these other things. So here's our challenge. And we'll go to this slide. And this is what Jethro is trying to show us. Are you embracing what you do well? If you're driving towards burnout, the way, if you've ever, anybody ever uh, driven into like a hydroplane situation or skidded on the snow? Anybody ever have that? What do we teach our young people? You don't pull the wheel the other way. You pull into it with your wheel, right? So let's embrace what I do well 
and let God kind of settle the situation down, and maybe there's some pruning I have to do. But in our marriage, if you say to me, hey, David, you don't get it. My marriage is in flames right now. Okay, thank you for being honest. The reality is, is that it's not that everything is going poorly. Maybe a lot of things are going poorly. There's probably something in your marriage that you can embrace that is a common ground. In your parenting, you can say, my parenting is on fire right now. Okay, once again, there's got to be something we can start building on because Jethro says, let's start with these things. Let's continue to do this. Start here. Are you embracing what you do well? That leads us to our next part of it. In, in verse 21, leaders build teams, so I will too. Because Jethro says this, select from all the people some capable, honest men who fear God and hate bribes. Appoint them as leaders over groups of 1,000, 150, and 10. So, he says, start by embracing what you do well, and now build a team. Here's the thing. Can we all agree that when we feel stuck, um, we all know we need to ask for help? Who has a hard time? Let's be brave and honest. Who has a hard time asking for help? I do. My hand's up. Literally, I'm not just showing this to you. Okay, thank you for being honest. If you have a hard time for asking help, who agrees that, okay, I'm willing to be brave and ask for help, but I don't know who to ask help from? Can we agree? Okay, so Jethro gives us this amazing. Look at this. I want you to write this down or take a picture. This is from the text. This is not me. This is Jethro. David doesn't get credit, but I love this. Jethro is going to give you four criteria for who to include. These are who to ask for help from. People who are capable. Who here wants to learn to play the guitar? Okay, I'm not going to be your guitar teacher, okay? I don't know how to play the guitar. I tried to teach someone to play the drums when they were in high school, and they still can't play the drums, okay? You got to pick the right person. You can't pick someone who you're like, I like this person, they're so great, but they're not the right fit. So if I'm asking for help in my marriage, in my parenting, in my workplace, in my spiritual life, I got to pick someone who's capable of supporting me in the role. Okay, honest. It's self-explanatory, but in our postmodern culture, it's really, really invaluable. It was really invaluable thousands of years ago with Moses. When I'm asking for help, if I don't feel that the person I'm asking for help is honest, that's not the right person. So I want to find someone who it's a good fit, good role, honest. Now here's the next one. This will be the most controversial of the four because the reality is fear God means pick people who understand that God is God. And you could say, David, you know, the problem with that is that I don't have Christians available in every area of my life. So that's true. We have to be on it. First of all, you're in the church. There's lovely men and women of faith here who want to help you on your journey, in your marriage, in your parenting, in your workplace, in your spiritual life. So I want to start with that. Look around the room. Okay. There's people here who fear God and want to help you, and they love you. They, they want to pray for you. They want to go out to coffee with you. They, they do. I, I see a bunch of them. I'm not going to point people out, but like, there's a ton of them, first of all. Second of all, yes, it is true that we're not always going to be able to get Christians in everywhere. So I'm going to do a caveat. If not everyone that you put on your team that you ask for help fears God, make sure you include some Christians. Is that fair in your team? Maybe they won't all be Christians. Okay. Let's, let's include some Christians. Let's find that person at work who is a Jesus follower. Maybe they don't go to this church. Maybe they go to a different church. Let's get to know them a little bit. Hates bribes is one that's easy. They say everybody has a price. Okay, maybe that's true, so let's set that aside. But the reality is, is there's some people that are trustworthy and some people are not, right? There's certain people that we know that they're not really loyal. This is a loyalty question of, is this someone who's going to really be with me, or is this someone who's just really fickle and really all over the place? In my marriage, in my parenting, in my workplace, in my spiritual life, the people that I ask for help from, I want to pick people that I know are rock solid and that are meeting with me and talking to me because they care personally about me. Or at least, if I'm meeting, for example, with a professional counselor, that they care about the occupation of being a psychologist and doing right and following the DSM and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, that leads us to this. Who's a John Maxwell fan? I knew I had one super fan. I actually put this in for you. I, 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 my super fan in the room, you know who you are. So, 
Look at this list. John Maxwell is a pastor, and actually Inc. Magazine at one point said that, and I will quote it because I love this, he was named the number one leadership and management expert in the world as a pastor. How cool is that? He has this really cool idea where he says this, a leader's potential is determined by those closest to them. That if you want, if we've all identified we're all leaders now, if I say, okay, I'm a leader, am I finding people who are capable, honest, fear God, hate bribes? So here's my question. Who's on your team? Are you willing to build a team? Maybe in there, your marriage, you say, my marriage is on fire. Okay. Are you willing to pause and build a team? Ask for help using that criteria? Your parenting. David shared with you, I shared with you that I'm having a hard time. We're, we're figuring out the potty training thing. We're building a team right now. I joke about toddler summits that we're having with some parents and some experts. We're building a team, okay? In your workplace, maybe you got a difficult thing from a boss or whatever. Are you building a team? Are you working together or are you isolating? Because Jethro's advice here really applies in your spiritual life. Are you building a team? You come to church, that's wonderful, thank you. Are you building a team through the rest of your week and saying, hey, these are people that are going to support me? Who is on your team? And here's the final part of Jethro's advice. So leaders share the load with their team. Teams share the load, so I'll work with mine. And so Jethro looks at this in verse 22. Here's what he says. Here's what that team should be. He gives the criteria He says those four wonderful things. He says they're capable, honest, fear God, hate bribes. And here's what they're going to do. They should always be available to solve the people's common disputes, but have them bring the major cases to you. Let the leaders decide the smaller matters themselves. They will help you carry the load, making the task easier for you. So notice that there is a very clear division of labor in your life, in your marriage, in your parenting, in your workplace, in your spiritual life. I'm not saying that Jethro's advice is to hand everything off to your team. There's got to be a division of labor. We got to still take some responsibility. So Jethro is clear that the common disputes, the team can handle it, the little things, the day-to-day. Maybe you find yourself, okay, here's an easy one. You find yourself as a parent. Maybe there are some things that you literally just let the math teacher be the math teacher. And you don't have a degree in math. Now, that doesn't mean you don't check on the homework. You absolutely do when you check in with them. But maybe the math teacher is just the math teacher. And I don't have to, I don't have to be so worried about that common disputes at 9.32 a.m. in the math classroom because the truth is, is that my role is really to do the, the big issues. Maybe at, with my teenager, I don't have to worry about that math assignment and what's being instructed in the math classroom. Maybe I really need to be talking to them about the difficult topics and the challenging things and showing them faith, right? So that's the division of labor here, because the major cases go to Moses or to each of us. So as we're sharing the load, that doesn't mean giving everything important away. That means sharing the load, literally. I think of geese. We live in a part of the country where we have geese. Now, everyone knows something about geese, that geese fly in Vs, right? Here's something you maybe didn't know. Not every single One is a leader. Some of those geese never go to the front. Some of the geese, that's not their role. Yes, they switch, and so you may see in the sky the V with all the geese, that you'll see one goose move and another one take its place. There are some geese that never actually go to the front because not every role is appropriate for every person. Jethro is clear about this. He doesn't say, hey, you need to do this in a way where every single person gets an equal leadership thing. They say something different. He says, there's going to be some people over 1,000 and some over smaller numbers, even down to 10, and they're all valuable. They're all going to help share the load. They're all important. We have different roles. And as we look in our marriage, in our parenting, in our workplace, in our spiritual life, We don't necessarily have to say, hey, am I giving every single person a shot to be my key advice person? But you say, hey, God's put wonderful people in my life. I look at those four qualifications. Let's go over them again. Capable, capable, honest, fear God, hate bribes. Those are great. Am I sharing the load appropriately with them but still taking ownership for my life? So my question is, 
Do you have the courage to share the load? It's really hard to share the load, right? Because it's scary. Anybody ever have this experience where you try sharing the load and it goes spectacularly bad? You don't have to raise, oh, thank you for brave people raising your hand. I love it. But the reality is, right, just because one time I shared the load and it didn't go well doesn't mean the next time it won't. Just because it went well the one time doesn't mean it will not go poorly the next time. We'll have some of both. But do we have the courage to share the load and say, hey, I'm not giving up my responsibility in my marriage, in my parenting, in my workplace, in my spiritual life, but I'm sharing the load. I'm asking for help. I'm getting people that have these qualifications. I love these. I'll read them again. Capable, honest, fear God, hate bribes. And so what's the outcome? Because the reality is, is that our problem for today was this. Our problem was that it's easy to grind, fully embrace being busy, and drive towards burnout. So what's a better outcome? Here's directly what the Bible says. If you follow this advice, and if God commands you to, you will be able to endure the pressures. You'll be able to hold on in an appropriate way. Not, not a holding on this way, but a saying, okay, I can continue following. I can continue lead, following God's leading. And these people will go home in peace. Because here's the untold thing about if I'm struggling with burnout today or heading towards burnout, am I the only person who suffers? The people around me suffer in my marriage, in my parenting, in my workplace. Endurance for me as a Christian leader, right? Because if we answered, if we answered yes to both of the questions... Endurance for me, and now peace for those around me. Because here is the thing. I am a leader who builds a team and shares the load. I don't need to be the person who's the great I am. Moses tries sitting there, and Jethro says, what are you really accomplishing? Like, okay, you're sitting and hearing everybody and wearing yourself out. You're wearing them out. Remember, when Moses has to sit, and this is really helpful, when Moses has to sit for 12 hours and listen to people, that means they have to queue in a line for 12 hours. When I'm taking on everything myself, it means that I'm queuing up other people too. Maybe my family is sitting there, my kids are just saying, hey, when's dad going to be around? Because like, I, I love dad and he's silly, and, or I, I want to hear dad's advice, or I want to watch basketball with dad. The reality is, is that if I can be a leader who builds a team and shares the load, everybody wins. This is what God asks us to do. This is part of the gospel message, right? The reality is, is that we know that Jesus comes because we can't take it all on ourselves. And we know that we're given the church, we're given other Christians because we can't take it all on ourselves. So we're going to read this together. Our big idea for today in 3, 2, 1 is I am a leader who builds a team and shares the load. So we love having an opportunity for responding at the end of a worship service. I'm going to put a prayer point up on the board. If you are heading towards burnout and you need support in any area of your life, the elders of the church are going to come forward. In the epistle of James, the letter of James, it says, is any of you sick? Bring forward the elders of the church. We do that as a practice in this church. We bring our elders down and we invite you. If you are struggling with this today, if you need support in your marriage, in your parenting, in your faith, we want to pray for you. It's not that there's a miracle cure. It's we know that the prayer of the righteous person makes a difference. And God hears us and listens to us. We love you. We care about you. We're on this journey together through the Bible this year. And I want to ask you to do that brave thing. Come down, receive prayer, start talking about, okay, Maybe I'm in this point where Jethro would say to me, what you're doing is not good. I can be honest about that. If I'm heading towards burnout, if I'm grinding, and if I'm really embracing being busy, and I'm driving towards that place of burnout, God wants to have me let go. And not only let go and let God, but also there's Christians here who want to support me. We're a loving community. We want to work together. So I invite you come forward, pray with us as we sing Great is Thy Faithfulness.